Hi, good evening. Thank you for joining with us on this beautiful day. I'm Laurie Trungone, the Service Line Leader for Women's and Children at Inspira Health. Our presentation tonight is brought to you on behalf of the Spirit of Women program that we have at Inspira. This program allows us to bring to you timely topics that we can help provide information to you about in a fun and innovative way. And tonight is no exception. We have a really good presentation in store for you. As usual, we encourage you to ask questions throughout the event using the Q&A button. Your questions will only be visible to our presenters and your identity can remain anonymous. So we hope you feel comfortable asking whatever's on your mind. Throughout the presentation tonight, you'll see poll questions come up on your screen. All your responses will be anonymous as well. And we encourage you to participate. It's really what makes this kind of fun. This presentation is being recorded and an on-demand version will be available to you. You'll get a link tomorrow so you can view the presentation at a later time if you would like. So let's get started. Um, it's my privilege to introduce to you tonight's speakers. Dr. Elaine Chang is a general surgeon at Inspira Medical Group General and Vascular Surgery. She earned her medical degree from Weill Cornell Medical College and completed her residency in general surgery at New York Presbyterian Hospital Weill Cornell Medical Center. She later completed her fellowship training at the University of California in Los Angeles. She specializes in robotic and minimally invasive surgery, intestinal surgery, hernia surgery, and abdominal transplant surgery. She is a member of the American College of Surgeons, the Association of Women Surgeons, and the American Hernia Society. Dr. Chang has published many articles and has earned the Intestinal Transplant Association Young Investigator Award. Hello, Dr. Chang, and thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you, Lori. I'm very happy to be here this evening. I look forward to spending the evening with all of you. Very good. Next, we have Dr. Rebecca Freyd. She is an Inspira Medical Group uh, family medicine physician. She completed her undergraduate education at Binghamton University in New York and her medical training at the Uni New York Institute of Technology College of Osteopathic Medicine. She is a board certified family medicine physician who completed her residency education at Inspira Medical Center in Vineland. She serves at Inspira's Health First Obesity Medicine Fellow, continuing her training in obesity medicine, and she works with the Inspira Medical Group bariatric surgeon, Dr. Keith Kreitz, at the IMG Bariatrics in Malta Hill. Dr. Freight has always been passionate about the fields of nutrition and fitness and the important roles they play in disease prevention or improvement. She is also a certified personal trainer through the American Council on Exercise. Welcome, Dr. Freed. Thank you. Very happy to be here. And next, we have Vanessa Vander. Um, she is a certified pelvic rehab practitioner. Vanessa is a licensed physical therapist at Inspira Health in Malika Hill. She graduated with her Bachelor's of Science degree in exercise physiology from the University of Delaware and has a master's in physical therapy from Rutgers University. And she is a member of the Philadelphia Regional Pelvic Physical Therapy Alliance. She then received her doctorate in physical therapy from the University of Medicine and Dentistry of New Jersey. She has worked in both the acute and outpatient settings. She specializes in pelvic health and she received her certificate of achievement in pelvic physical therapy and her pelvic rehabilitation re practitioner certification. Vanessa has done numerous lectures in the community and also educated physicians on the importance of pelvic floor physical therapy. And welcome to you, Vanessa. Hey everyone, really excited to be here tonight. Look forward to speaking with all of you. So thank you all for participating and helping to educate our audience about abdominal health. Our program today is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. Having a strong core is important for our everyday lives. The benefits um, of a strong core include performing everyday acts and tasks, whether at home or at work, ensuring a healthy back, participating in sports and other pleasurable activities, even doing everyday activities like normal household chores, fix at work, gardening, which is my favorite, <laughs> balance and stability and good posture. So let's start with uh, Dr. Chang. Can you tell us what the abdominal core is? Certainly. So our abdomen is surrounded by muscles in all directions. And that includes um, the diaphragm up above. That includes the traditional abdominal muscles on the front and on the sides. Also includes the back muscles and also the pelvic floor at the bottom. 
Um, and so if we have a weak abdominal core, um, there can be many consequences, which range from lower back pain um, to diastasis recti, to getting hernias, um, but also pelvic floor dysfunction. Very good. So let's uh, next do a poll question. So true or false, the abdominal muscles make up your core. True or false, the abdominal muscles make up your core. And if you just answer the um, question on your screen. And we'll go to, let's see if people are correct. So 81% of our audience thinks that the abdominal muscles make up your core and 19% think that that is not true. So Vanessa, can you tell our audience is correct? And uh, what are the core muscles and how do they function? Well, the binaural oh. end was correct. We actually, the abdominals are only one part of what of the muscles that make up the core. As Dr. Chang just said, the core consists of four muscle groups, the top being the diaphragm, the front and sides, which are your deep abdominal muscles, your deep back muscles, which are called your multifidus, and your pelvic floor, which supports the bottom. These muscles are in charge of back support, balance, postural stability, proper breathing mechanics, and also helps you with lifting heavy loads and performing daily activities. So. Um, what are the signs of a weak core then? So these are not limited to, but some of the signs of having a weak core is a big one is lower back pain. We see a lot of patients in physical therapy daily for lower back pain and their treatment is core stability strengthening or posture or balance, falling or being at risk for falls, poor standing tolerance or walking tolerance. So if you can't stand for more than five to 10 minutes or walk, that's a big one for a weak core. Um, if you're having shortness of breath, um, just general fatigue or weakness. Big one that I specialize in is incontinence or pelvic pain, and also difficulty with lifting even light to moderate loads with household chores or even with work activities. Dr. Chang then, why is uh, core strength important? So a weak core can have many consequences and Vanessa actually just touched on some of these consequences um, and that includes lower back pain, um, poor posture and poor balance, um, weakness of the pelvic floor can result in urinary inton incontinence, um, constipation, pelvic pain, um, and also pelvic floor dysfunction. Um, if we have weakness of the abdominal muscles on the front and the sides, we can see bulging and bloating of the abdomen um, it can also result in diastasis recti and hernias. And specifically also um, weakness of the diaphragm um, can also result in a hiatal hernia, which is associated with acid reflux. I've heard the term and I've seen women who have the residual effects of diastasis recti. Can you help us understand kind of what that is? Sure. So the front of our abdomen is actually lined by uh, what we call the rectus abdominis muscle. And that's the muscle that is responsible for um, people who have six packs or eight packs. Um, now, diastasis recti is the separation of these muscles. Um, so the connective tissue um, in front of, uh, or between the, uh, between the rectus abdominis is really stretched apart. Um, now, pregnancy is the single most important risk factor for getting diastasis recti, particularly in women who carry multiple babies to term um, or very large babies that are carried to term. Um, mothers who tend to have a smaller stature or older mothers are prone to getting diastasis recti as well. We also see diastasis recti in obese men um, and some postmenopausal women um, or occasionally in cases where um, you are ignoring your form while you're performing heavy lifting or exercises. So what are the symptoms of, um, of the diastasis recti? Oftentimes diastasis recti shows up as a bulge um, in the middle of the stomach, um, which I like to call either looks like a speed bump or a cob of corn. Um, and this bulge is particularly noticeable when you're tensing up your abdominal muscles, such as during a crunch or sit up or a cough. Um, now, some of the symptoms of diastasis recti can include the symptoms of a weak core, which are poor balance, poor posture, um, limitations during physical activity, um, pelvic pain or hip pain, as well as lower back pain. 
So is there a way for us to see if we have it? Yes, yeah, so there is actually a, an easy test that you can do at home. Um, and you get into this position as shown in the picture, line your back with your knees bent so your abdomen is relaxed. And then you're gonna use one hand to support your head and lift your head off the ground. With your other hand, um, you're gonna take two fingers and feel for a gap in between your abdominal muscles about a couple of centimeters above your belly button. Um, now, if that gap is wider than two finger breaths, then you may have diastasis recti. Of course, if you're suspecting that you have diastasis recti, I recommend consulting with your doctor or a physical therapist uh, to confirm or for further evaluation. Okay, so let's ask our audience another poll question. Uh, diastasis recti is not preventable, true or false? Diastasis recti is not preventable, true or false? Give you a couple seconds to answer that. We'll see where you land and then see where we need to go. Okay, so false, 80% of our audience thinks that diastasis recti is preventable. Um, so let's have Dr. Freyd let us know um, if you can treat or prevent diastasis recti. Yes, yeah, so 80% are correct. Um, of course, uh, you can prevent diastasis recti, um, just like you can prevent many other you know, medical conditions. So um, what I know best, of course, is weight management. Um, and that incorporates many things such as nutrition, the way we eat, um, medications uh, for weight management that uh, many people aren't familiar with, which you absolutely cannot use during pregnancy, um, during conception, or while breastfeeding, just to throw that out there. Um, physical therapy to help strengthen the core with proper exercises. Um, compression garments or the use of a binder, and then alternative medical therapies such as acupuncture, yoga, Pilates even, um, as well as surgery. So you mentioned nutrition. Um, can you tell us how what we eat can play a role in preventing diastasis recti? So again, more so in my opinion, but um, I don't like diets. I don't think they work long term because it's difficult to say, sustain um, a particular way of eating. Um, and also what works for, let's say me, does not work for everyone else. And that's kind of something that you have to figure out um, what your body responds best to. So you really wanna create like a lifestyle um, that's beneficial for you. And that includes like mindful eating. How do you feel when you eat certain foods? Um, exercise, self-care. Um, these days, no one really takes care of each other anymore. So you really have to um, focus on yourself sometimes and push other people to the back burner occasionally, um, especially if you're a parent. Um, all too often I hear people say, oh, well, I skip breakfast because I'm trying to eat less. And I'm like, well, that's the most important meal of the day in order to get your metabolism going. Um, and then, you know, these days there's a lot of convenient, um, options that aren't as nutritious. So you really have to be mindful about what you choose for the first meal of the day. And if you eat something and you feel like you can fall asleep, it doesn't make sense. Food should give you energy. So if you feel tired from food, it might mean that your body really doesn't love that particular food that you chose. So mindfulness is everything, meaning you have to start listening to your body because it always will tell you what it likes and what it doesn't like. So my mantra is pairing different food groups together. Um, and what I mean by that is I never like a carbohydrate by itself, a fat by itself, or a protein by itself. Um, when you have one particular food group by itself, especially with carbohydrates, um, sometimes, you know, your blood sugar can spike and then it kind of plummets, causing you to be very hungry again. So it's very beneficial to always pair a carb with a protein, protein with a fat, a fat and a carb. So that way your metabolism stays nice and high. Um, you're less hungry and more satisfied. You don't have those like sugar plummets or spikes and, and plummets. Um, and you wind up eating less of one food group because now you have the other food group there that's uh, usually slower to break down. So we, we wind up not overeating as much when we pair food groups together. So in terms of um, medications for weight, there's many out there and you know more on the horizon as well, but um, some forms are injectable medications. And what many of them do is they slow down digestion. Um, so that way, you feel fuller uh, faster. They make you more sensitive to insulin because when we eat, insulin is released. Um, but many of us, our bodies don't always respond well to insulin, especially for people who have 
polycystic ovarian syndrome or prediabetes, and of course, diabetics. Um, so these medications really say, hey, he or she just ate, you know, now insulin is coming out, let's do something with the food rather than just nothing. Um, they also decrease the amount of sugar that's released into the blood after you eat, um, and it decreases fat that's stored in the liver. And then in terms of oral medications instead of injectables, because um, injectables scare some people, which I understand, um, there's many options. So some medications will suppress your appetite. Um, other medications help with mood and focus. They also decrease the pleasure response um, and, that you get from certain foods and can increase your energy levels. And then we have some medications that help decrease um, the chances of like nighttime eating or, or binge eating, which is a problem for many of us, um, especially if you're not eating enough throughout the day. And then other medications help to decrease the absorption of sugar and increase the breakdown of fats for energy. And again, make your body more sensitive to insulin. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Vanessa, can you tell us if physical therapy can help with diastasis recti? Absolutely. If the diastasis isn't more than three wing finger widths crossed, like when you tested yourself, physical therapy can definitely help strengthen the deeper abdominal muscles. It also can prevent further separation of the diastasis or prevent any hernias, um, kind of retraining those muscles um, to not keep that separation or to have things folding through. Um, one of the most important things um, are motions that you really should avoid when you have a diastasis or think that you have a diastasis. Um, and these are similar to some of the things that like after you might have some type of abdominal surgery um, that you wanna avoid. And these exercises include double leg lifts. So anytime you would lift both legs off the ground together, um, a full push up or sit up, um, a plank and heavy lifting without proper abdominal bracing. So any heavy lifting weights or even things that you might be doing around the house. Um, one of the biggest things that I say for uh, diastasis is you will find everything and anything on the internet for this. And this is where things can go a little awry. There's a lot of people that say they're certified in treating this and they're, they're just putting out exercises on YouTube and things like that. But this is something where you do want to seek medical attention. If you think that you may have it, you want to see your doctor and then, you know, in turn, see a physical therapist um, for, you know, proper diagnosis and also proper core muscle training for that. So these are some things that you are actually acceptable to do um, that are safe to do. Just a little kind of brief overview. Um, you want to really avoid those exercises that cause any intra-abdominal pressure or increased intra-abdominal pressure. And that's really heavy lifting. Um, we find this with a lot of CrossFit athletes and running. So things that are really high impact um, these are where we need to be careful. So just a very simple exercises, as you can see that you have them on your screen, um, is a core stability march. And it's basically where you pull both your pelvic floor and your transverse abdominus in while you do a little march with your legs and you lift back and forth. And then the second exercise that you have is a bridge. And it's the same kind of concept where you want to engage the pelvic floor and the deep abdominals first before you perform the bridging exercise where you lift your bottom off of the floor. So I'm assuming, Dr. Chang, if all else fails, there are surgical options um, for diastasis? Yes, there are surgical options available, but these are typically reserved for the most severe cases, such as if you are not able to sit for longer periods of time because you have pain, or the pain is preventing you from doing your normal exercises. Um, surgery is also an option when there is a hernia present in the background of diastasis recti. Um, there have been studies um, that have shown that surgery for severe cases with diastasis recti actually reduces disability and improves quality of life. Um, and actually, these studies have shown that day-to-day -day activities, such as making a bed, um, getting dressed, um, leaning over a sink, um, sitting for longer periods of time, um, doing light exercises, performing light lifting or heavy lifting, carrying a bag, running, um, and surgery actually improves um, uh, your quality of life and reduces pain, reduces disability when you're performing these day-to-day -day activities. Now, traditionally surgery um, would uh, be performed by a plastic surgeon um, because even in the medical community, 
diastasis recti was considered to be more of a cosmetic problem and not a functional problem. So women would have to seek out a um, plastic surgeon by themselves. Um, that often means that they have to pay for the surgery out of pocket. Um, and the surgery um, conventionally would involve very large incisions. Um, and these incisions um, would go up and down the belly, oftentimes all the way across the bikini line as well. And that allows the plastic surgeon to access the muscles um, to be able to stitch them back together. Um, now, because of these long, gigantic incisions, um, surgery typically meant a very long recovery time. It meant more pain afterwards, um, and also uh, predisposes the women um, to a high rate of complications, such as wound complications and infections. Um, but nowadays, there are minimally invasive um, surgical options available. Um, with the um, recent advancements in minimally invasive surgery, we can actually perform the same operation um, either using laparoscopic instruments or, or using the robot. Um, and so through several small laparoscopic incisions, um, we can actually um, suture the muscles back together. And that translates to faster recovery after surgery and less pain, uh, as well as fewer complications. I'm sure most of us have, here tonight have heard the term hernia. Um, Dr. Chen, can you tell us what that is and what the symptoms may be that indicate you might have a hernia? Surely. So a hernia, um, to put it simpler, is actually a, an area of weakness or an actual hole in your abdominal muscles. Um, now, diastasis recti, by virtue of, uh, of uh, stretching out the connective tissues, can predispose you to getting a hernia. Now, in the early stages of the hernia, and uh, when hernias are small, you may not have any symptoms. Um, but I often tell my patients that a hernia is like a hole in your clothes or your socks. Um, once they're there, they're not gonna close up on their own. In fact, um, they can get um, bigger over time if you continue to use these muscles. And so um, as the hernia gets bigger, you can begin to feel some symptoms such as noticing a bulge or swelling over the area, um, or in more severe cases, you can begin to get discomfort or pain. So let's ask um, our audience a poll question. Um, smokers are at higher risk for a hernia. True or false? Smokers are at a higher risk for a hernia. Let's give you a second to answer again, and then we'll see where we are with that. All right, a few more seconds, and let's see what you think. Um, the majority of our audience thinks that that's true, that smokers are at higher risk for developing a hernia. Dr. Chang, can you tell us if they are correct? Yes, so the majority of our audience is actually correct. Smoking is a risk factor for getting hernias, um, as are um, sometimes family history um, can be a predisposing risk factor, um, age and pregnancy as well. Um, also, you wanna be um, maintaining a healthy weight because obesity increases the intra-abdominal pressure um, and as can um, certain types of activities such as persistent cloth or heavy lifting. Is there something we can do to prevent a hernia? Yes, there are several things that we can do to prevent hernias, um, such as maintaining a healthy lifestyle. Um, Dr. Frey talked about managing your weight and, um, and that is actually a very important um, way to prevent hernias. Um, you also want to quit smoking, um, or visit your doctor if you have a persistent cough. Um, using correct form and avoiding strain um, during bowel movements and lifting heavy objects is important as well. So if we do find ourselves in this situation where we have a hernia, what can we do to treat it? Mm -hmm. So in the early stages of the hernias, you can actually take certain measures to try to prevent the hernia from progressing to a point where you would need surgery. Um, so avoiding heavy meals, um, avoiding certain um, physical activities, um, such as bending and crunches. And if you do have to perform heavy lifting, use correct form. Now, in the specific case um, of a hiatal hernia, um, the symptoms of acid reflux can actually be um, controlled with medications. Okay. Some of you may remember we did do a Spirit of Women program on pelvic floor physical therapy, and we explained what it was and how we can maximize what it does for us. So Vanessa, can you review for us what is the pelvic floor and what role it plays here? 
Sure. The pelvic floor is a group of muscles that surrounds both the vagina and the rectum and the same area for men as well. Um, and those are basically like perform, they are a sling for all your abdominal content. So they're basically your bottom support. Um, they play one of the most important roles in core stability and also strength of the core. Uh, the pelvic floor muscles are responsible for bowel, 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 bladder, sexual function, childbearing, and also, as I said, support of the abdominal contents. Um, they're also in charge of pressure control. When you cough, you sneeze, or you lift, which is really kind of a generalized for all these issues that we're talking about is really heavy lifting can cause a lot of these problems. Um, these muscles need to be able to both contract and relax on command and automatically during functional activities, specifically with the lifting. Um, and a lot of my patients actually have trouble with relaxing these muscles versus contracting, which is not what you would actually think would happen when they come to physical therapy. So tell us if there are, what the exercises are to help us. Well, this is just a good exercise. And actually it's one of the exercises that I'd give to all of my patients. Um, I think that um, the normal population breathes with only their chest. So we really never get into the bottom of the lungs or ever get the diaphragm to move. And when the diaphragm actually contracts, so we do a deep breath, it actually helps the pelvic floor to relax and move how it should in our body. So if you kind of look at the diagram, when the diaphragm, when the diaphragm contracts and goes down, it also causes the pelvic floor to relax. So you can actually try this at home. If you take a deep breath, we'll put a hand over your belly button and try to push the breath into you, push, push your belly out into your hand. It's very difficult at first, but when you practice, it becomes easier and easier. This type of breathing works with our body's natural mechanics um, and would help with our, during our functional activities. These exercises are also good for mental and emotional benefits as well because um, it kind of takes your mind off things and focuses just on your breath. So tell us about pelvic organ prolapse. We've heard the term, I'm sure, and I'm sure people know people who have had this issue. Help us understand this. So we've been talking about diastasis and the separation of the abdominal muscles and also with hernias where things are kind of popping out. And this is the same with a pelvic organ prolapse. You can have any of the pelvic organs such as the uterus, the bladder, or the rectum kind of bulge through the vaginal wall, which then you might actually see something there. And potential symptoms of this, if you were really concerned about it, were a, a feeling of heaviness, or you could actually see a bulge or a falling out in the vaginal area. Um, pelvic pain can also be a sign of a prolapse. Um, sometimes you can have incomplete emptying of your bowel or your bladder. And then sometimes it's indicative and can cause back. Okay. So what causes that to happen? A lot of things can cause this. One of the big things is that heavy lift again or improper lifting. So really not using your core muscles when you're doing those heavy lifting activities. Um, a couple other risk factors could be trauma to the pelvis. With, when you have a vaginal childbirth, maybe the, the child was a large birth weight. Um, chronic straining with toiling, so chronic constipation, years of straining and pushing, um, and also people with respiratory problems who have a chronic cough. Can we prevent it? Yes, we can definitely prevent it. Um, if you practice what Dr. Freight is talking about, maintaining healthy weight, um, also if you have a chronic cough or chronic allergies, um, and it's something that's plagues you every day, it's something to get treated by your doctor. Um, learning proper lifting mechanics. Uh, we treat, you know, all kinds of patients every day who work in warehouses or nurses or doctors who are performing these lifting maneuvers and are not lifting with their core muscles or their leg muscles, but using other muscles that are, you know, causing intra-abdominal pressure. Um, treat constipation is a big one. We can do pelvic floor exercises and physical therapy and smoking cessation. Wow, okay. So the message, well, tell us what the benefits of physical therapy are with respect to prolapse then. 
So if you do have a, a, a prolapse and it's, it's you know, manageable, um, you know, which is something you would want to see your doctor about, um, we can, in physical therapy, we can retrain the pelvic and the core muscles. We can have those muscle groups work together so that, so that we can prevent the prolapse from getting worse. Um, we can also, with that breathing exercise, help restore the body's normal breathing mechanics to optimize core muscle function and prevent the symptoms of incontinence, back pain, pelvic pain, and the prolapse. So the, the weak abdominal core is not just simply a cosmetic problem, it's a functional problem, um, and it can affect your quality of life. Many conditions can be prevented through proper diet and exercise, as Dr. Freight explained to us, um, and then some of those exercises that we've gone through with um, Vanessa. Physical therapy is a great option for moderate conditions, and then obviously there are minimally invasive surgical options for severe cases, um, as Dr. Fang explained to us. Um, we are going to now um, answer any questions. And I see one question, and maybe Vanessa, you can answer this about pelvic floor, I mean, about prolapse. Um, how do we know we have a prolapse? Um, so basically you might have a feeling of heaviness in your vaginal area. Um, you can also possibly see something bulging out. Um, that would be uh, one of the symptoms of prolapse. And that would be something to see that your OBGYN doctor about, um, and they would be able to diagnose that and then tell you the next step from there. And then Dr. Chang, um, how do people know if they need to come see you? Should they be going to someone else first? Or how do, how do people know to come to you if they have either a hernia or uh, diastasis recti? So um, I have actually seen it both ways. Um, there are often times that people bring up these issues um, to their OBGYN doctors or their family doctors, um, and I get the referrals that way. Um, but I certainly have people who um, have thought that they had a hernia and made an appointment um, directly with me, and I have seen it that way as well, and I can do the initial evaluation. Okay, thank you. So uh, another question we have here is what happens if you don't treat a prolapse? Can the organs actually fall out? Uh, no, is that for me? <laughs> uh, well, you might as well, go ahead, thank you. No, they, they can actually fall out, but it, it would be how much of a, how much or how far that bulge is coming out. That would be distracting. So if you're actually feeling it, in the vaginal opening, that's that's when you would know it's it. That's probably the worst type of prolapse that you can have. But it will actually fall out. But it will come past the vaginal area, and you will see it. Um, and then, um, Dr. Freyd, uh, how can weight loss cause a hernia or cause an issue? Um, well, it depends. Um, if you're losing weight in a beneficial way um, and it's not too much too quickly and you're also trying to exercise at the same time because I think it's important to remember that um, exercise while it's not for like weight loss per se even though it can help um, is really important for to prevent a lot of these issues that we have so if someone is not um, providing like proper nutritious nutrition to your body and you lose a lot of weight um, that can cause like your muscles to also weaken as well um, so you almost want to make sure that you're, you're feeding your, your muscles as well to kind of strengthen them while you're losing weight at the same time, if that makes sense. So that's how like excessive weight loss can lead to hernia um, versus like, you know, the excessive weight gain. Um, right, does, that, right. does that kind of make sense or? Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Chang, how long is the recovery after hernia surgery? So recovery after hernia surgery can vary. Um, when hernias are smaller, um, with particularly with the minimally invasive options, I certainly have patients who are fully recovered after a week or two. Um, and depending on um, what types of activity that you typically engage in, or what um, are your demands of your job, um, you know people have gone back to work as soon as a few days after surgery. Um, but if your job requires a lot of standing or heavy lifting, your recovery could be more um, in the order of weeks. Um, and now, however, if you wait until the hernia is the size of a basketball before you come to seek medical attention, obviously your surgery is gonna be a lot more complicated and recovery time can be longer. 
Okay. I do not see any other questions. Um, I would like to really uh, express my gratitude to all three of you for joining us tonight. Um, we really appreciate the education. Um, as always, any of these educational offerings that we bring to you, we want to be want you to be able to stay healthy, get the assistance you may need. So we're here for you should you need anything. Um, thank you also to our public relations team, Susan Lauren, for helping us to put on these programs that they always help with us. Um, and our next Spirit of Women program is uh, the Skinny on Skin Cancer on May 19th with Dr. Kulkarni. Um, in the meantime, please stay safe, everyone. Continue to wear your masks, stay six feet apart, wash your hands frequently, and thank you for joining us tonight.